And good, what is it? Good, cold, snowy Sunday morning. <clears throat> At least we didn't get as much as they thought we were going to get. Yeah, that's what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, I told my brother to get snow. It's strong this morning. Yeah. I, uh, I broke out my snow thrower Wednesday or Thursday. Couldn't get it started. And I figured instead of wearing out my shoulder, I'd just run an extension cord over and plug it into the electric start. Boom. Got her started. I got a text from my daughter because I told her, you better get yours ready. Mm -hmm. She texted me back. She goes, first pull, it started. And then uh, Thursday, Rick was here. He popped up while we were having our meeting. Oh, I'm just checking on the snow thrower. We're supposed to get a bunch of snow, so I wanted to make sure it works. So yeah, you got that taken care of. And voila, nothing yet. So uh, if you haven't got your bulletin, we have a nursing home sing today at two o'clock at Shunbra. And uh, so if you can avail yourself of that, please do. And just check your bolt. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the night's rest and for the day that you have given to us. Especially this day, Father, where we can come together in faith and worship you. We ask your blessings upon this class and all the classes that are meeting, or whether it be here in Dover or throughout this country or in the world. Uh, look down upon the, the teachers and uh, give them a ready recollection of what they're going to teach so that there would be listening ears to take it in and to draw closer to you. We thank you for your love and for your son. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, last week in review. So Eric taught last week, and I think in the video we find that Jesus was in his hometown of Nazareth. And there was a lot of discussion. Did you get a paper, Pam? Uh, there was a lot of discussion regarding... Uh, you know, they, they didn't believe him. So the question is, why? Why didn't they believe him? Why did they have questions about it? They knew him growing up. Okay. Well, what did they say? They, they asked the question. Just a carpenter. Is this a carpenter's son? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so what? You know, his... His fame had already spread throughout Galilee. And yet, with what he was doing, and yet he goes to his hometown. You know, if you have a hometown hero, what do you normally do? And we have one. Uh, Armstrong. An Olympic swimmer. Dover High grad. Okay, so we have a hometown hero. Didn't his family have a hard time with it too, though? I don't know. I didn't hear anything about it, but, you know, he still traveled. Not him. The Who? The Lord's family? Oh, yeah, they did. Because the same question pops up that we're going to see that we've been covering for the last uh, seven weeks. Yeah, they had a hard time. So he didn't do anything, hardly. He did a few miracles, but they didn't believe him. They didn't, they didn't. They why, didn't understand. Why didn't they do it? Because they didn't believe. Yeah. Here's a question. Um, well, we know he was teaching with 12. Uh, yeah. But do you think that maybe Jesus, when he was younger, because, you know, nobody was ready to know who he was, did a little bit more to blend in instead of, you know, making it pretty known, like, well, this kid's a little different. Because obviously, I mean, we don't have other material to look at to, like, like, oh, well, between 1 and 12, he was like this, between 12 and 33, you know, so. Well, at 12 years old, what happened to him? Water and wine. What's that? Water and wine. Not at 12. He wandered off. He wandered off. He wandered off. Yeah. 
He wandered off. He was in the temple. <laughs> All right. At nine years old, our youngest son wandered off, scared us, and went to Dover Pool to see what it looked like empty. We were at, well, then it was called Park School. But yeah, well, I think he did things that normal kids did. Uh, after that incident with the temple and, and it was 12 years old, he said he went home and he was subject to his, to his parents and he, he grew. So this could have been a much bigger shock because like, if he was acting like a normal child and he just grew up because the world wasn't ready for him yet, well, I mean, that uh, that could have been more the reason why it's like, what? Like, seriously, this kid, the one that's been right, that ran around and did this and that? Making chairs and tables and stuff? I can see that. And then he says, no prophet is without honor in his hometown. Another thing, God wouldn't, I mean, his hometown there like that, God wouldn't force them into believing. Uh -uh. If they didn't want to accept him, right, just moved on. Then. Yeah, um, that's like now, you know, if if uh, someone, when my aunt, she would always bring up my <clears throat> holy childhood, and then you know they see a difference, and sometimes they want to bring up your past, and that's a different joke. Yeah. That's a different joke, but they they can't accept it. So he, you know, and what was the other saying about Nazareth? Does anything good come out of there? Does anything good come out of there? Well, they did, and they, they didn't recognize it. Okay, Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. Okay, and there was a reason for that. However, the question arises is what about today? Do we go out two by two, or do we do one on one? Or do you go out at all? I think it's easier to go two by two. Uh -huh. But if you're if you're studying with a friend or a, a, a close uh, uh, relationship, is it two by two? Well, you could ask them if they would if that would bother them. Uh -huh. Is it mandatory to be two by two? So now you, you're sitting in your living room and you're watching a movie or you're listening to music and you hear a rap on the door and you open up the door and there's these two fellas in a white shirt and a black tie and black pants. And how many usually are there? Two. And what organization do they usually represent? Elders. What was that? They're, they claim to be elders. Elders. Uh-huh. But they're young men. They are young. I had one time, someone walked up my door, it's like, I was like, yeah, I hear the good news all the time, every Sunday at my church. Or if I can just go, I can just go get my Bible right now. And they're like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I mean, is it mandatory to do two by two? In the New Testament, in the church, we don't, we don't know how, we know the gospel spread. Did it spread by two by two or one on one or you know? But we know it's we, we knew it spread, and it probably had to do with the relationships of the people. The people saw something was going on with these individuals and wanted to know more. The crowds continued following Jesus, and we've seen that in in the video. He said they were like sheep without a shepherd. <clears throat> And so the question is, what about today? Bad. <clears throat> Are we like sheep without a shepherd? Is the world like a sheep without a shepherd? We have a shepherd. We have a shepherd, yes. And we've been brought into uh, his fold. But what about the rest of the world? They're running here and there and doing this and that. Being married, giving in marriage, you know, working a job, going to school, doing all the activities of daily living that we do. Do they have a shepherd? Yes. Some do. They have a shepherd, but they don't recognize the shepherd. They, 
don't rec that's a good one, Cindy. They don't recognize the shepherd. Uh huh. And the last one, the apostles remain astounded. Now, I think at the conclusion of chapter six, Jesus was once again walking across the Sea of Galilee. The disciples, the apostles, were in the boat. And Jesus was going to walk on past them and meet them on the other side, but they saw him, so he got in the boat and the waves calmed down. And it says they were astounded. Why? They've already seen what he could do. He's fed 5,000 men. He's, he's healed the sick. He's casted out demons. And yet... They're astounded. And I think another word would be That's amazed. That's still amazing, though. For them, that was still amazing. Uh huh. But they, they, I don't think they had figured it out yet. So, with that, we're going to go into chapter 7. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So, you have a map. And, uh, this is actually just a review that we know that through chapters 1 through 8a, the people are trying to figure out who this Jesus is. Is he a prophet? Is he a king? And they wanted to make him a king. Or is he the son of God? Have they even considered the fact that he is the son of God? Now we do know that the demons knew who he was. They didn't have to figure out who this Jesus is. As a matter of fact, they would proclaim it and Jesus would silence them because it wasn't time for him to be revealed. And even when he was doing his miracles, as we'll see later in chapter 7, he tries to tell the people, do not spread this. Don't tell anybody. But it's interesting in uh, when he cast out the, the demoniac that had the legion in it, he says, tell, tell your family and those around. But again, this was in a, Gal or a uh, Gentile area. So we're still looking at this, but we're getting close. So, last week we found him in Nazareth. This week we find him in Capernaum, which is about a 40-mile journey. Okay, so he went back to his hometown. And in the scripture it says he was in the house. If you remember, whose house did he have his headquarters in? It was one of the apostles. Paul. No, wasn't Paul. Peter. Peter. Peter and Andrew, his brother. Okay. So that's that's what that was his home base. All right. And then later on, we see that, or early on, we see that the scribes and the Pharisees came from Jerusalem. To visit Jesus which was a journey of about 75 miles all right so they traveled 75 miles to see Jesus and we're going to cover some of those reasons why and then later on in the story he goes to the region of Tyre and Sidon which is about 35 miles all right and that is Gentile country of Phoenicia um, Canaanite area. And then later he goes to Sidon, which was 20 miles north. And then afterwards, he'll, he'll go through um, and end up in uh, Caesarea Philippi and Bethsaida, and he goes in that direction. So, with that in mind, let's watch the video. <coughs> <clears throat> now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. 
And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon gone. side into the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. 
And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. And they came over unto... Sorry, that's next week. <coughs> <clears throat> so what was so important that the scribes and Pharisees <clears throat> traveled 75 miles uh, to see Jesus That's the opening statement we see that the scribes and the Pharisees they came. Wanted, they wanted to trap him. Okay. Yeah, they, there, there was definitely a reason for this. I mean, all right, he has been he has been performing these miracles, especially on the Sabbath. Okay. Keeping You're right. So one of the the, the their whole their whole purpose was to expose Jesus as a lawbreaker and to find grounds to accuse him. Because, well, I, I think we find later on in, in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, they were jealous. His popularity was growing immensely. And so they, they were very jealous. Uh, Eric? This is the reason why their hearts weren't in the right place. Where they really worried about, oh, he's making, you know, he's, he's blasphemy and he's saying all these bad things, you know, this is not our God or whatever. Or it's like, he's making us look bad out here. They're coming to him, they're not coming to us. They should worship us. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, I guess I can imagine how frustrated Jesus was. Like every time they came around, because of their hearts and because of you know where they're, why they were doing these things. It wasn't, it wasn't because they felt like their religion was being threatened. You know, you bring up a good point because we've all been, we've all been exposed to people that <clears throat> when they show up, it's doom and gloom, or there's something wrong. Or there's something always wrong and uh, so they always have this cloud on their head and they want to spread this the storm and you, you kind of you can take it two ways okay oh uh, here they come again all right Lord help me <laughs> uh, and it, it, it seems that way with the scribes and the Pharisees because they were <coughs> bent on accusing him exposing him and wanting to get rid of him He's a threat to their way of life. Yeah, and we're going to see that. Um, why were these religious leaders so concerned about hand washing? That was their tradition. Okay, and what what did the tradition... <coughs> what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There. What did that tradition teach? They had to wash everything. Everything they touch, even their couches. Right. But it was teaching something. They were afraid of ritual impurity. Okay? Now, ritual impurity, um, well, it had nothing to do with hygiene. Nothing. So when they washed their hands, uh, they would actually use a clenched fish, fist, and they would put it in the water shake it off and they would wash but ritual impurity is like a disease to them it spreads and it comes in contact with other items let's see what did I write down here the disciples 
uh, had not ceremonially, ceremonially washed their hands before eating. Ritual impurity was considered to cling to objects including cups, saucers, pots, etc. It was a violation of Jewish tradition, but not Old Testament law. So what was the problem here? It was the same to them. It was the law. And they couldn't see past that. And that's what Jesus had a problem with. Why did Jesus quote I Isaiah? Have that same problem. This ritual of washing. I have that same problem. Yep. Because of touching people's things. I have a problem with that. Well, there, there are people. And with, uh, you know, in the, in the field of medicine, when you see a patient, and you're going to go see another patient, what are you supposed to do? Wash your hands. Okay. Um, and why? Sanitize. Yeah. Disease. And yeah, you have bacteria on your hands. Okay. You go to the bathroom. You relieve yourself. What are you supposed to do? After you're done, wash your hands. Okay. Why? It's a, it's a matter of hygiene. Okay. So, when I was going to preaching school, one of the instructors, or when I was going to go, one of the instructors at the Doraville Church of Christ, we had a fellowship following, and then uh, we went over to his house. I don't know, Pam, I don't know if you, you, you probably don't remember this, but him and I were getting ready to sit down and just have a snack or something. He goes, okay, hold on, let me wash, let me, let me wash the, the brethren off my hands. So, and I knew exactly what he was talking about. And so, yeah, I mean, you come in contact with people and we do know from a microbiological standpoint that there is a lot of bacteria on these hands. And so, I mean, you're touching your eyes, your face, whatever. And so you wash your hands before you eat. It's a matter of hygiene and not ritual purity. So there's a reason for that. Um, why did uh, why did Jesus quote Isaiah to the scribes and Pharisees <coughs> now keep in mind who these people are <coughs> so why did he quote it it applied to them so. yeah because in his opening statement he said something um he says, uh, one, they were familiar with the Old Testament texts and revered them. They studied them. They revered them. So now Jesus is hitting them with Isaiah 29, 13. And he says, as it is written, okay, uh, which is a formula that recognizes the text as authoritative <laughs> scripture. And so they, they realized that. And uh, the passage condemns substituting God's word for human tradition. And Jewish leaders only pretended to serve God with lip service. Their focus was on external rituals and traditions of human origin. And Jesus was trying to point this out to them, but they could not see it. He's trying to teach them that these rituals you're doing is not doing you any good. It's the defilement that's within yeah. that's causing your problem. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, so when you dig deeper into what Jesus is teaching the people, we could actually, you know, on this side of the cross, we can, as we study it, we can see it better. Uh, he doesn't shrink or shy away from the accusation of the Pharisees. As a matter of fact, he even <laughs> agrees with them to a point, knowing full well that their the, the, the motivation for them washing hands is not for hygiene. It was to make their hands holy or whatever else they're using to make it holy. But it was something that they came up with. It was a human tradition. What is Corbin? Yeah, it's given to God. All right, so 
what about okay you have elderly parents and mom, mom and dad dad's not able to work anymore he might be disabled or weak and so uh, as you are working you set aside some funds to help your parents what does the New Testament say about uh, taking care of family? You know, it's worse than an infidel. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, how do they get out of it? God's money, we can't give it to you. We can't, we can't give it to you. Yeah. So, they nullify God's word. Um, it's, to, it's to be used for support of aging parents, but more for the temple use. And they nullify it. And Jesus is bringing this <clears throat> to their attention. <coughs> Do they see it? They don't see it. Yeah, Terry. I think I read something where it said uh, under the old law, if you didn't take care of your parents as they aged, I believe it said in there that you could be stoned. Yeah, to honor your father and your mother. Yeah. Uh-huh. And if you spoke evil of your father and your mother, get a rock. Here. <coughs> I remember some watching this uh, documentary on Netflix. I don't know which Asian country it is, but they don't, they take care of their parents they when do. they get old. Uh -huh. And here in America, you know, push them to the nursing home. She's like, well, it makes me kind of feel bad. I do a in <coughs> nursing homes, but... It's a shame that that doesn't happen here. Um, some people do that, though. I know a couple have done it, but yeah, we don't do that. That's not an American tradition to take. You're too much. Is there a, is there a difference between tradition and culture? Yeah, I think there is. Uh, Middle Eastern customs. Excuse me, Middle Eastern culture, um, I'm, and I'm talking uh, Mediterranean area. Uh, those families are close knit, and a lot of times they'll do their best to keep that parent there because they're the glue that holds the family together. And when they die, the family kind of goes because the patriarch and the matriarch are gone, and then the family falls apart. I mean, my family is a good example of that. Um, but I, I guess it's, it is tradition. In, in this country, in, in nursing homes, <coughs> for some, it is, a, it is a necessity based on the medical needs of the person. For others, it's a way out. See, I won't have to worry about that because Dad said he's going to be mowing my lawn when I'm 90. So that makes him what? 120. 120. <laughs> yeah. there. Uh -huh. How does tradition? Oh, wait a minute. Let's do this. All right, we got that one. We got that one. Oh, wait a minute. Corbin, today, and I think we kind of covered that a little bit. Um, <coughs> we do give money to the to the uh, to the church for its operations for the spreading of the gospel but do we do anything do we practice Corbin not like they did no I don't think so um, usually we have like mom and dad will set an inheritance and then if you're bad, they'll spend it. <laughs> yeah, name a boat after inheritance. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. Not in, not in America. I don't know about, you know, the Far East or Russia or <laughs> Europe. Discuss how traditions affect service to God. So some of the things that I've seen were based more on, I don't know if you could say it's tradition or doctrine. Um, but what traditions do affect service to God? You know, he was saying, 
teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Matthew says the same thing. Um, so what, what are some of those things? Well, you see changes in the church. You can ask Willie, well, we didn't used to do it that way. So, you know, a lot of changes have happened over the years in the church. So let's look at worship. <coughs> are there any traditions in worship that affect service to God? We know that worship, you, you have prayer, you have singing, you have preaching, uh, you have the Lord's Supper, okay, and you have giving. And these are the examples that we got from the New Testament church. Now, it doesn't say when you're supposed to do those things. Normally, it's what well, we have an opening prayer or an opening song, a prayer. Maybe a couple more songs. The Lord's Supper. Preaching. The invitation song. Closing prayer. Oh, we have giving too. Does it matter what order we put them in? Is that a tradition? And does it affect your service to God? Or does it affect the worship? All those things are important. But worship is an individual thing. You don't actually need all that. I mean, there are certain things that we're required to do in worship, but to have two songs in it, it doesn't matter. Worship is what I do in my heart, mm -hmm. and it has no bearing on it. It's spirit and in truth. Yeah, so, okay, so what if you have, <coughs> you know, we used to have the collection after the sermon, and if it was bad, collection didn't go too well. No, it's not really. Um, but, yeah, but, you know, uh, it doesn't matter the order as long as there is an order. I went to a church one time in the South and they did collection first. And I thought, boy, this makes me feel like I'm being paid. I'm paying to come to worship. Uh -huh. And it didn't look particularly like that. Yeah. Um, one of our one of our brethren, uh, Dan Barker, at one point, and I think this may have happened in other congregations. Dan was leading, <clears throat> was presiding at the table, and for some reason, the cup went around first, and he realized his mistake. But you know, it was already done. Oh well, it was there. Uh, normally it's the bread and the cup but okay so does the order of worship make a tradition can it be a tradition it can get to that but if you're worshiping in spirit and in truth it shouldn't make any difference um, what about baptism how can a tradition be how can it be uh, uh, using baptism as a tradition? Baptism, we know, deals with immersion. But we don't immerse. Well, if you look at the Catholic faith, it's tradition for them to baptize the babies. Okay. You know, right away. <clears throat> that's, to me, that's tradition. That's not, you know, something that that we're taught. Mm -hmm. And when they baptize, are they immersing? No. Yes. No. Sprinkling. Pouring or sprinkling. Uh -huh. Yeah, to be a believer to make any difference. Right. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Correct. There's a reason for baptism. It's the remission of sin. So there's another thing. Baptism. Is it for membership? Or is it for the re remission of sin? Okay. There's, a, yeah. If you want to be a member of the congregation, we need to baptize you. Do we? Does the Lord's Church fall into that problem or that tradition? It should, because once you're baptized, how do you become a member of, of God's body? 
what happens? What, is, what does God do? The Lord adds. He adds. Okay. Uh, what causes spiritual... Oh, wait a minute. What causes spiritual defilement? And I think Jesus actually pointed some of that out. What's the origin of spiritual defilement? Our hearts. Yeah, what, what was that? The things that come out of the man. Things that come out of the man. And his heart, not his stomach. Okay? So, uh, and he, you know, he, uh, uh, what I wrote down here was practicing customs or actions that can bring on God's wrath, quenching the spirit, or weaken the spirit to cause a falling away. And that was the practice of sin, like Jesus pointed out. Okay? So if you continually practice sin, boom. How can a disciple of Jesus keep their hearts from being defiled? And there we go. There we go. How, we can, how can we keep our hearts from being defiled? The word shall I store in my heart that I might not sin against you. Oh, very good. Yeah, Psalms. Uh huh. Store the word in your heart. What we say and our evil thoughts destroy us. Okay. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. I come up with I come up with several things, just Bible passages. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. Study to show thyself approved. Pray without ceasing not forsaking the assembly, bearing fruit, and growing in grace. Those are some of the things that I came up with. And so as you're doing all those things, is it a work? Are those things a work? Work out your salvation in fear and trembling? Would that be a work? Study, praying without ceasing, uh, growing in grace, bearing fruit, I think it's a work. But you're not working your way to heaven. You're working your way to draw closer to God and farther away from Satan's power. Um, why do you suppose Jesus went to the Gentile region of Tyre and Sidon? It didn't say that he went into. However, you know, he went in the region. Why, why would he go to the Gentiles? There's people there in need. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's what I came up with. He knew about that Syrophoenician woman. He had to. In the Old Testament, Elijah went and helped the lady. One with the oil and a son. And she was a Gentile. And so he went there. Uh, he went, one, to get away from the influence of the Jewish leaders. He was seeking privacy and was to be a guest of someone living there. They knew who Jesus was. His fame had traveled throughout all Galilee, and there were some who came from Tyre and Sidon to hear him. Um, how would you describe the Gentile woman? I came up with three. Actually, I researched it. Came up with three characteristics. One, she approached, she approached Jesus, she was a Gentile. She approached the master, which to me would make her bold. All right? The other one is, as he talked to her, she was still persistent. Yes, but the dogs have the crumbs from the children's table. She was humble. And that was the third one. She was humble. And, and Jesus, you know, so, uh, what do you? Why did he? Why did he speak to her in this way? Wasn't he kind of? Did you think he was kind of brash when he spoke to her? It's like a riddle, almost. See, see if she really knew what what she thought she knew. Uh huh. Uh, he was testing her. Uh -huh. He was testing her. Uh, describe in one word the reaction of the people with the healing of the deaf mute. Amazing. 
Okay, amazing. Uh, I came up with astounded. Okay, same thing. And they still haven't figured out who Jesus was. And then lessons from the deaf mute. Okay, for the sake of time. The Lord is concerned for individuals as well as the masses. Uh, we are to care for others. We are to give people individual attention. And I love the, the, the scene where he takes that deaf mute and he just takes him off by himself and he does what he has to do um, and then I look to the father for strength and obey Jesus in all things Terry I want to say one thing here uh, I didn't figure this out maybe everybody else can it. but when he's saying that to the lady uh, the children of the Jewish people you know, the bread is the message the uh, children is Jewish people and the dogs are the Gentiles. Yeah, well, in that sense, that's how we look at it. But in, in the language that was used, it was a pet dog. So it wasn't as offensive. But yeah, the dogs are the Gentiles. That's where it is referred to. Yeah. yeah. But she says, yet, yeah, but. So, next week, Mark chapter 8. And we'll be looking at Jesus is now on the way. So, we don't have time for questions. So, thank you for your attention. Make sure you read Mark chapter 8.